annual unpleasant job to end sessions, you know, come in and brutally cut them short. Um, this is to call upon our next set of panelists. Vikas Singh, Samhita Arni, Kavita Kani, and Nidhi Dugar Kundalia to kindly gather backstage so that they may come up for their session on In the Shadow of the Gods. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and today we have with us, um, like she introduced, uh, Samhita, Kavita, and Vikas. Um, each of them have written a retelling of the epics, the Indian epics, Mahabharata or the Ramayana from the perspectives of lesser known characters, from the perspectives that look at, uh, at multiple layered individuals who end uh, stories which exist in both the epics. So let's begin with a question which also will sort of work as an introduction. Um, each of you have written a, a, a perspective to the, both the epics. Uh, Samantha has written from the perspective of uh, a child, the Mahabharata through the perspective of a child. In fact, she has written it when she was around eight years old, the Mahabharata. Yeah, it was published and when I was 12, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Kavita speaks through Uruvi, Karna's wife. And uh, whereas Vikas has spoken through the voice of Bhima. So how did you know that each of these voices were the voices that you were going to use? And that the voices that you were uh, going to uh, use to tell the, uh, tell the, retell the epic? So let's begin with Samhita. Uh, uh, so basically the, the Mahabharata thing was, I, it's called Mahabharata as a child's view because I was a child at the time and that was a marketing gimmick. Yeah. Here by the Mahabharata, it's been written by a child. So we have to put that in the cover as well. But it wasn't, I mean, it was it was just a normal retelling of the Ramayana. It just ha I'm, yeah. a Mahabharata, it just happened that I was yeah. a child. Um, the other book that I've done um, is called the uh, Sita's Ramayana, which is from the perspective of Sita, but she's a very well-known character. So True. I right. guess she doesn't fall into this category. Right. <laughs> What about you, Kavita? Mm, I think I tackled both the epics, but I think it wasn't very intentional. Um, I started off with Urmila. Uh, I think she's not uh, marginalized. I think she's completely overlooked. Right. Uh, so uh, the, the problem with Urmila was that uh, it happened with uh, even Karna's wife. That the, uh, is not being marginalized. I think people don't even know about them. The first reaction I got about Karna was, oh, Karna is married. Mm -hmm. So that's how the title came about. Right. Uh, same thing about Urmila. People know her as Lakshman's wife at the most. Right. They don't know, many don't know, do not know that she was Sita's sister. So the perspective comes through that, through that entire thing that com people are ignorant about them. Mm -hmm. And actually searching them from the shadows and who have been languishing so long. And then it's not a retelling of uh, the epics, I would say, here I would definitely say. It's more a revision. You see the epic through different eyes. It's a different viewpoint. The moment the spotlight is on these people, the entire plot and the narrative can change. Right, right. So that was, uh, and my third book is not, definitely not either about Ramayana or the Mahabharata. It was about Menka, which is mm -hmm. again a marginalized character. But then she, her story has been mentioned in the Mahabharata. But again, you know about Apsaras, you know about they're supposed to be the symbol of female sexual power, beauty, they are the mm -hmm. temptress. But then what, what is beyond them? Right. So I think it was more of uh, enlarging their character rather than um, retelling of the epics, as you say. It is like yeah. I was more uh, I was more interested in fleshing out their characters than the story per se. Pretty nice. <coughs> yeah. So uh, you know, I have a small child. She's about seven now, and she was about uh, five when I started writing the book. And like uh, all uh, or a lot of very harried Indian parents. Uh, my child is a total fan of Chota Bheem. Oh. And, uh, you know, she would sort of pester me every day, tell me a Chota Bheem story. So I'd actually seen two or three episodes, and after those two, three episodes ran out, I started making up stories and yeah. telling her, you know, Chota Bheem in Africa, Chota Bheem in Antarctica. <laughs> and uh, one day I couldn't really think of any more stories. So I said, uh, you know, I sort of racked my brain in desperation, and I said, Did you know there was a Bada Bheem as well? And she was, Really? There was a Bada Bheem? She was fascinated. <laughs> So <clears throat> I started to tell her the story and then it just struck me, you know, this is an interesting story. But uh, at the same time, I was also reading a lot of books. Uh, there's, of course, The Palace of Illusions. There is uh, Yagya Seni. I also read Karna's Wife, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of struck me was that, uh, you know, Draupadi, depending on whom you're reading, the great love of her life was either Arjun or Krishna or even Karan. But uh, poor Bhim never gets a mention at all. 
and then i said you know but wait a minute this is the guy who killed all 100 kauravs for her sake he committed what is arguably the single most brutal act in the mahabharat which is ripping apart dushasan's chest and taking his blood so that tropti could wash her hair uh, when they were in agyathwas he risked blowing their cover to kill kichak just because he was harassing dropadi and the poor guy whenever a book is written from dropadi's point of view never merits even a line yeah. <laughs> you know so i just felt there was a there was a scope there to write a book so ultimately this uh, you know sort of captures most of the events of the mahabharat but it retells it as a sort of love triangle between arjun dropadi and bhim which added a little more piquancy because here is the greatest warrior of his time completely in love with this woman obsessed with her willing to go to any lengths for her she couldn't care less about him uh, you know and under normal circumstances maybe it kill the guy whom she loved but he couldn't because this is his brother Yeah, I think he was the hero of the Mahabharat. Actually, if you say because he actually uh, Bhim is not only did he fight for his woman, he was the one who killed all the uh, hundred uh, the Kauravas. He was the warrior. He, I mean, we talk about Arjun and we talk about Yudhishthir, but it's always Bhim who is uh, very, very sadly uh, sidelined. I think so. And he was the one who rooted for um, Draupadi as well, pretty much. Yes, he was. He was the most loyal husband. I mean, he was the he was the I think uh, he is the lover which every woman should want. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was loyal till his last breath. True, true. He was devoted to her. True that. But so, uh, sadly, too often gets taken for granted that kind of lover. You know, you always <laughs> look for the guy you can't get. <laughs> well, we have a lot to learn from the epics. But uh, yeah. sorry, if I can just add one line. Sure, so, sure, please uh, go ahead. You know, I sort of uh, in college I was in Delhi University, and there was one particular hostel which was called. Uh, uh, you know, we had a term called Fosla. which was fully one sided lovers association <laughs> and my particular hostel was called fosla ka ghosla because there were so many of us there so oh. <laughs> well so um since all of you have touched mahabharata through your books you know unlike ramayan mahabharata does not have distinct binaries you know the right and wrong are relative and there is no particular dominant narrative So does it retelling become problematic when you are rooting for a single character in a lot of ways or uh, let's start with vikas this time <coughs> no i think if anything you know it sort of uh, adds to the uh, it it gives you a lot more scope because it's a little like being handed one of those children's coloring books where you have the outline but you can pretty much color it as you like and uh, you know the thing about the mahabharat again is that you can take any character like anand neel kanthan in fact has written with duryodhan as the main character uh, and he makes pr- a pretty ca- uh, compelling case and you can viewed from that character's perspective you can completely justify everything they do so it could be you know duryodhan it could be bhim it could be yudhishthir it could be anybody i think finally the lesson that you take away and i think it's a very important lesson in our time is that if you really want to justify any act of retribution or violence you can and this will ultimately take us into a vicious spiral which will only end badly and really the only way out of that spiral is for somebody to say i forgive you and i give up my right of retribution um i think where uh, mahabharat and ramayan is concerned uh, especially ramayan i mean we see ramayan uh, it has a distinct white and black uh, uh, color uh, but when i'm i'm talking about urmila uh, actually the uh, characterizing uh, fleshing out uh, lakshman was more difficult mm. urmila yes urmila is a mentioned and uh, she was uh, i could sort of mold her the way i wanted her to be yeah, but yeah. lakshman has uh, he has been completely his sexual identity has been completely sublimated mm. you either see him as a uh, doting brother or a devoted brother in law you never see him as a lover a husband mm. or even a son Okay. even an angry son who is against uh, dashrath uh, rulings oh so you only see him as a man who is of who has a short temper who sort of uh, uh, breaks into a temper or has a short fuse uh fleshing him out was uh, definitely more difficult because there is an image about him with urmila i uh, had uh, somehow of course uh, she has been said that she slept for 14 years in the original text so i could play around with her either as lakshman's wife or as uh, sita sister and above all i think a janak's daughter i think janak is an extremely uh, intriguing character i think mean, i think he was the first feminist i would say because he was the only king who really never ever wanted a son and to be a daughter of such a man and i'm quite sure she must have been a copy of his 
somehow i mean the being his daughter a person who have, i mean uh, who used to have philosophical conferences every year in his court he was a rajrishi and which were later compiled as Upin- upanishad being his daughter must have been something and that is what i found uh, intriguing about urmila so it was not as i mean the title is sita sister because sita because she is uh, sita is like she their soul sister but i think it was she as janak's daughter and her development how does she tackle the 14 year separation and as janak's daughter i think she does that because it is her not only her emotional growth from a girl to a woman it is uh, her intellectual growth she herself becomes a scholar and how through her serenity her acceptance of a certain fate and she sort of embellishes herself as not just as Lakshman's wife or Sita's sister or Janak's daughter, she becomes a woman in her right. She becomes, she is an artist, she is a painter and she takes advantage of having a Vashist in her court, in the royal court and she becomes a scholar and that becomes her, what do you say, her meditation, of her meditation for her 14 years. I mean, we talk at that, it's her private exile too. We talk about the exile of Ram, Sita and Lakshman, but it was her private exile. And how did she uh, handle the exile? Same thing with Karna's wife. I mean, to be a wife of a man, uh, of such a man, and then in the end, as you say, how much of anger and hatred can you keep? In the end, you have, there is a point where you come to forgiveness. You have to come. And I think I sort of, I'm not going to tell the story, but it's about uh, the story. The book is about Karna. The hero, it's, the hero is Karna. There are a lot of women there. It is, so his wife, Draupadi, Kunti, I think Kunti has a huge role. So this whole connotation is about, uh, it's not just about good and evil, you know, what we are talking about. If we think about epic as good and evil or right and wrong, it's more about the shades. I mean, each person, I think, goes through that. Uh, how he becomes black in a white situation, how he becomes a white in a black situation, and how the th- things can change and he has no control over it. Right. That is what I think uh, each character in the epics actually teach you. Because it's not about marginalized characters or main characters. I think marginalized characters we tend to overlook because they are meant to be that. They are not the protagonists. But by making them so, like whether it's Karna's wife or Urmila or Menka, uh, we see them in a different light. We see them, not only them, we see the other characters in a different light. Vis-a-vis, as I said, the, the moment the spotlight is on uh, these people, the equation completely changes. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, answer this question in context to the Ramayana, uh, because yes, we do have a tendency to see it as a very black and white epic, particularly today, but there have always been the way, um, uh, there's a tradition of retelling the Ramayana, some way, sometimes in the voices of these other characters, and this is a historical tradition that goes back for centuries, and some of it is oral, and that brings out nuances that we haven't, we, we wouldn't have considered before. For example, I mean, there are old traditions where the Ramayana is told in Sita's voice, and this influenced my second book, Sita's Ramayana, where there's a there's a subtle criticism of Ram's actions, and this whole idea of good and evil and what dharma is becomes much more complicated. What even complicates that further is that a lot of these oral traditions are by, uh, passed on by women who are in the marginalized communities, Dalits, the Patua community, so on and so forth. So that adds another layer. They're, they're talking about kings and justice and oppression and in addition to the gender dynamics, another kind of political dynamic emerges. Um, my last book, The Missing Queen, actually the idea of, of the perspective of, the, of all these different other characters, Angad, Vibhishna, Trijata, uh, was a sort of an inspiration for that. Um, it, I'm just to tell you a little briefly about the book. It's just a, uh, a re- uh, it imagines the Ramayana if it was happening today, in today's India, contemporary, uh, v- somewhat political as well. And uh, it's a journalist goes in quest of Sita, trying to find Sita's side of the story. And in an attempt to track her down, she encounters all these other characters, Angad, Vibhishna, Vibhishna's daughter, Shujata. And I found it really interesting to imagine what had hap- what would these characters have been at the end of the Ramayana? What would have happened to them? How would they reflect on their own actions and the story of the Ramayana? So for example, Angad is a little miffed about his father being killed. Obviously, that's a, that's a certain kind of an inequality that has happened, an injustice that has happened. Vibhishna, the kind of Vibhishna I imagine, had become king of Lanka, but uh, had, was now haunted by the ghost of his dead brother, the memories of his dead brother, Ravan. 
So it was really interesting for me to sort of go back and look through the, the uh, and try to imagine, get into these characters' heads and try to see how they themselves would reflect upon the Ramayana. Uh, I remember reading, uh, when I was reading your book, uh, Sita's Ramayana, there's this particular bit when you talk about Vibhishana and how he switched royal, uh, loyalties very, very quickly, you know, when he realized that the power lies in the hands of Ram. So could you elaborate on that? You know, I think a lot of other people have found that very quick, uh, very, uh, you know, interesting as well. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, I might be repeating a little bit of what I said in the, in the last session this morning, but I found Vibhishna's change of heart very interesting as well when you come to look at it through the perspective of the uh, 11th century Kamba Ramayana, which is written in Tamil Nadu, 12th century Kamba Ramayana, which is written during the Chola period in Tamil Nadu by Kamban. Uh, and uh, he, Vibhishna's daughter in this retelling is, is Trijata and uh, Trijata is Sita's jailer and uh, she's a Rakshasi and she also becomes in the course of Sita being uh, imprisoned in the Ishokavana, Sita's best friend. And uh, Trijata is like Sanjaya in the Mahabharata, she has this ability of Durdashan. She can see into the past and she can actually see everything that's happening also at once. Yeah. So when Sita is very despondent, it is Trijata who consoles her saying, look, you might be upset now, you must be worried. W is your husband coming for you? But believe me, and I have the gift of prophecy, I had a dream last night and I saw your husband come victorious to Lanka and he will come for you. But, uh, so Trijata is, is, sees the destruction of Lanka mm -hmm. as foretold. She sees the, she prophesizes that it, it will happen and that Ram will come for Sita. So at one level she is comforting Sita in this moment, but at another level she's seeing the destruction of her own city and her own people yeah. and her own family. Very yeah. troubling as well. So Vibhishna at some point comes to Trijata and he says, look, I've, you know, I've been listening to you and I, and I feel that Ram has the right in this, so I'm going over to his side. And so come with me, leave this yeah. and come with me. And Trijata says no. She refuses. She stays back in Lanka because one, she is Sita's jailer and she has some sort of relationship now with Sita where she is sort of help supporting Sita through this trial and telling her as well, because of this Durdarshan capability, what is happening on the battlefield. But on another level as well, sh it is her dharma, I mean, to remain with her people, even if, she know, if, even if you know that they're going to lose, even if you know the side is wrong, it's her her uncle might be wrong, but it is her dharma to remain with her people. So interesting. What a complex perspective. I mean, that redefines what duty and dharma is for me. Perhaps. But yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that is what exactly Kumbhakarna and um, Vibhishan were about. I mean, yeah. both um, the, uh, the way both the brothers reacted. But I think both were right in their own way. Mm -hmm. Completely right. I mean, it's like if you just take a small crime, I mean, about uh, between three brothers. A brother has been accused of, let's say, murder. One brother says, okay, take him to the cops. That's one brother's reaction. The other says, no, let, let's hide the crime. I mean, that sort of a thing. So what would you do? So I mean, these, that's, that's what I, uh, I think uh, mythology and epics tell you. At every point, they make you wonder, they ask the question you. You cannot judge. You cannot say Kumbhakarna was correct and uh, Vibhishan was wrong. Or Vibhishan was correct or Kumbhakarna was wrong. Because at every point, or even Ravan's character or Ram's character, I mean, each of them, ha they ha the reason why they grow, that I think that is that the entire growth of the character itself is interesting because it depends on us whether we want to see those characters growing. Because if we want to question each and every of the decision, everything of the step, it's very easy to say, oh, he did wrong, he did right. But that is not the uh, idea of our mythology or of our epic. It is basically to tell us, to make us think. I think that is what the, that is the charm of the story. So let's tackle each of their books uh, individually. Uh, Kavitha, in your version, um, it's interesting why you have chosen Uruvi, and n who's an upper caste daughter of a king, and not Supriya or Rushali, the more well-known wives uh, of Karna. Supriya, again, by the way, is a fictional character, like Uruvi. So see, that is, what, uh, that is the power of uh, fiction. Uh, Actually, uh, in the text, his, the name of his wife is not mentioned at all. Mm. So, Vrushali, yes, uh, through the years, uh, through the version, Vrushali was there. And then he had several wives. Uh, Urvi was, uh, I had to create her, because earlier my, uh, I wanted to write about Vrushali, but uh, in Marathi literature, uh, there's a book called Mrutanjay. And uh, I could not, I, I just did not have the courage to handle uh, Vrushali, because that, that book is an epic. And I did not want to corrupt her image. So, right. and I actually had a very, um, mm. had a sort of a dilemma uh, to be politically correct or incorrect because this whole problem of caste. Mm. And uh, I wanted a wife of Karna who could mix, be part of the royal intrigue. 
she could mix around in the royal court could mix around with the panda could talk to a kunti or a bishma and a vrushali could never have because uh, when i created uh, urvi it was as a sutradhar for yeah. karna as a conscience yeah. to karna mm-hmm. it was not i did not want to show karna in his glory of his nobility i also wanted to show his shades of black his weaknesses his, his it is his helplessness and his entire obsession with identity and right. being a wife of such a man uh, i think rushali had a limitations or i think i just did not want to i think i, I think i felt safer creating a urvi uh, rather than sort of molding a rushali because rushali or a supriya supriya is again uh, the creation of uh, shivaji savant she was supposed to be a uh, mm-hmm. parallel to subhadra in the in his book uh, like so i didn't want i did not want uh, i think i wanted a more of creative freedom that was the main reason interesting um with uh, about your book vikas um in your retelling of mahabharat you mention more kauravas than most of the retellings i have ever read yeah. uh, bhima seems to regret killing the kaurava vikarna yes. then you speak of dushkaran subahu mm-hmm. dushpradan chitracharan's yeah. death yeah, yeah. Uh, do you sort of have a sense of favor for the kauravas uh favor in what sense uh, do you sort of um, are you sort of empathizing or sympathizing <laughs> with them <laughs> well uh, you know this uh, this new book that came out until the lions uh, lists yeah. all 100 of them katha uh, karna is yeah. yeah yeah where she kind of uh, is narrating it also from gandhari's point of view and says you know they just clubbed as the 100 but here are all 100 names and she goes 1 2 3 4 5 6 which was a sort of impressive feat which uh, was sort of beyond me but <laughs> and at one stage i also sort of you know uh, deliberated uh, actually showing the killing of all 100 but again that would have you know stretched the book to game of thrones kind of uh, <laughs> length epic so i, d- I didn't f- want to do that um I think what I was uh, what I was trying to do and Bhim has those moments every now and then I was trying to go beyond Bhim as this very one dimensional character that is often represented as just a sort of unthinking brute who goes out and kills people and I wanted to show that he has a certain sense of empathy also mm-hmm. you know and in the sort of uh, final uh, in the climax he's talking to Duryodhan and he asks Duryodhan he says you know uh, you are known for your generosity you are famous for your generosity uh karun kunda was for a better friend than you you took this outcast and you turned him into a king you know why when you could find place in your heart for a hundred brothers couldn't you find place for five more um so he is uh, you know it's not just about hatred he's also genuinely trying to understand what is it that drives duryodhan and the others uh which is also what i was trying to i think reflect in the book so i i never wanted it to be a sort of black and white book because the original mahabharat isn't in any case it's a very complex work and i think one reason why it endures is because it asks the one question that is you know really timeless which is uh how do you live a good life when the world around you is falling to pieces and that's a question that we will all grapple with every generation will grapple with um samitai about your book uh, you wrote the book when you were a child uh, the mahabharat that is you know when you were, so what were you your reactions were obviously a lot more intuitive and a lot more individualistic uh, through the book you seem to have an apparent dislike for yudhishthir uh, you know to the game of dice uh, during the vastra haran during the war and even when they are uh, walking up to the heaven with a dog so uh, could you elaborate on that oh uh, yeah <laughs> I have to I'm now 31 so I have to go back and and try to time travel and think what I was like when I was you know a couple of decades ago uh but um uh yeah I definitely did not I was Yudhishthira was not my favorite uh character uh amongst the Pandavas and um and I saw him as I mean especially when you when you look at him in the game of dice and you and I mean we this issue came up in the morning as well the the, the the choice of being able to stake draupadi he doesn't own her actually he doesn't really own his brothers either D- can you own another person right. and and stake them so that was also very problematic and that brings up certain issues of i mean of of kingship as well as a king does a king own his subjects if he owns his brother then could he possibly own his subjects so those sorts of issues uh, really um troubled me and if he was um you know he didn't seem to as far as my memory rec- uh, recollection and you might be able to correct me but didn't raise much of a hue and cry about ekalavya's 
um, the, you know, the, what happened to Ekalavya, Ekalavya having to cut his, his thumb as a fee for Drona, which I felt is terribly unjust. So if you are the incarnation of justice, why are, why are you behaving in certain manners, in certain issues in a very unjust fashion? So that troubled me a lot as a child. As an adult, I have made my peace with it. <laughs> well, um, so let's look at the little people in the epics, you know. The little people, we're talking about the soldiers, we're talking about the footmen. Uh, you know, the other men who sacrifice their lives for the sake of dharma. Uh, uh, Kavita, you, you dedicate, uh, Uruvi dedicates her, the entire war time to the little soldier, to the soldiers of the epic and, you know, trying to save their lives or trying to mend their wounds. Uh, because you have a chapter dedicated on the, uh, no, uh, the lesser known heroes, Gatot Karch and Abhimanyu. And uh, Samitha, you speak of the widows of the Rakshasas. You know, uh, in your Sita's Ramayana, where you, when Sujita is narrating it to Sita. So these characters only seem to serve, uh, you know, only seem to exist to serve and glorify the more popular heroes. Uh, how, how, what, were they perhaps then the lesser known heroes of the epic? I think, you know, precisely because it's an epic, uh, and you have you have the main heroes, and then you have what are called the cast of extras. But uh, you know, a little like Shole where till today you can remember Surma Bhopali, and you can remember even those guys who had two-minute walk-ons. That's also the beauty of the Mahabharat that you know Abhimanyu just had a little bit role, but uh, you know he is a, such a fascinating character in his own right. I think Ghatotkach is also a very fascinating character, <clears throat> and what made it more fun for him, uh, for me, you know, writing was the relationship between Bhim and Ghatotkach. Because uh, in, in my book, uh, Bhim actually doesn't discover he has a son uh, till, you know, the son has grown up. So, yeah, so he's completely missed out on the sons growing up. And uh, also his relationship with Hidimbi, which is also uh, very fascinating, in a, in a way mirrors his relationship with Draupadi. Because she loves him unconditionally and he cares for her but doesn't love her. And because he is going through the exact same thing with Draupadi in reverse, uh, he is a lot more empathetic to the sort of pain and suffering that Hidimbi is suffering, you know. Uh, so, uh, that, I mean, Ghatotkach in the Mahabharat simply turns up and his job is to uh, take the, the divine weapon, you know, die at Karna's hands so that that weapon will no longer exist for Karna to use against Arjun. And then when Bhim finds this out, there was actually this passage where Bhim finds out that this whole thing was set up by Krishna so that Arjun could be spared and Bhim goes completely ballistic at that stage and uh, sort of threatens bodily harm to Krishna, which my editor was very nervous about, by the way. Uh, so it, uh, the characters, uh, I think they have parts, but they also, they, they give you a chance to uh, play, you know, you sort of use them as a backdrop to play off against the main characters and also to maybe flesh out more things about the main characters to give them a more rounded perspective. Yeah, you mentioned, uh Urvi and uh, uh, the soldiers. I think uh, in the epics, usually we talk about, we see only the two classes. We see the Rishis and the Kshatriyas. So we never wonder about, you talk about Mahabharata, the big war. You talk about the big war between Ram and Ravan. But what about the soldiers? Did they really want it? But for them, what difference did it make? They didn't fight for glory. It was, they just did it out of duty. I think so that's what, that was the, I think um, uh, Karna's wife actually was a, my little token for an anti-war uh, book because I, I personally am completely against war and it was where uh, she 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 was a, she, uh, she, her entire fight is not only for karna it's for peace not only peace for her husband because peace would give uh, a, a life for uh, for her husband but it was peace otherwise also so that is what she's supposed to personify all Urvi was because she when she's a healer she's not healing just the soldier's wound she's trying to heal the uh, the internal uh, emotional scars of each character in the uh, the Mahabharata here, and uh, the same thing. I mean, when I did uh, uh, Urmila, uh, like whether it was uh, in Sita's sister or even in Main Kachor. Main Kachor, I think this whole thing about uh, Apsaras and Gandharva we talk about, and we really don't know. Uh, uh, the sage gets uh, gets very powerful, and the the, the gods get. Uh, insecure and then the first thing they do is call out call in the apsara and say okay you seduce him and uh, that's how he gets completely uh, uh, what's it disarm so then these sort of stories are very often through the so that was what uh, sort of fascinated me let's talk about an apsara what does she what who is she i mean we talk about she's beauty she's uh, 
she like a blitz spirit but what and then uh, there were a lot of other apsara the urvi urvashi is the most famous and her romance with purura is uh, the, it's a classic love story so i said i decided on menka because menka again is an extremely small character but a very important character in the life of vishwamitra who was a huge huge uh, person again uh, vishwamitra again again it is a class uh, fight uh, vishwamitra was a king basically and he gets defeated by vashisht in one of the because he wanted to there's a story behind them and then he realizes the limitations of royal power and then he wants to become a rishi you know that arrogance for knowledge it is not just thirst for knowledge it's arrogance for knowledge and then uh, vishwamitra was in he was huge i mean uh, vishwamitra as a character and then uh, his battle is basically between uh, worth and birth just like karna where he wants um, karna wanted his identity i think vishwamitra wanted his uh place in heaven where place in heaven in the sense as a scholar uh so being a seducing such a powerful man uh being responsible for his downfall and then being also the reason for his glory so she must have been some sort of an exceptional woman uh to and then her entire thing about uh, shakuntala she is being the mother of shakuntala and uh, even shakuntala per se uh, fascinated me because uh i think the biggest reaction i got after menka's choice was why did you sort of change uh, menka's story uh shakuntala story and then i said no i have not changed shakuntala story that is original shakuntala story because if i ask everyone out here i think that is the story they will know about shakuntala is that she was uh, the dushyant the shivalin love with dushyant and then he forgot about her and all. i said no that is not the story that, that is kalidas's version so that that is the power of changing a writer changing the you know the uh, authorial version how he has the power what kalidas did he had just picked up a story from about shakuntala and menka and then he changed it into a classic love story completely changing dushyant's character dushyant was not the hero as what you what we think him to be it is when a 12 year old son asks her, who is my father that is the time shakuntala goes to dushyant and confronts him so being the mother of such a uh, such a woman i mean she, she again if menka is the symbol of uh, uh, not only female sexual power i mean uh, something she is the symbol of heaven and she comes to earth to search for her own heaven so that was the story in menka so in sita sister uh, we talk about urmila we talk about her cousins uh, we don't know about sita what is sita i mean we talk about see you see sita only as ravan's cons- uh, ram's consort so what was her life what was her childhood and uh, the whole thing of being adopted i think that sort of intrigued me and how would an urmila the natural born child of janak react would be of jealousy would be of acceptance or would they be a sort of a simmering resentment and then uh, how could she be the sole sister of uh, sita you know that sort of a, and the other two cousins also i mean they married bharat and uh, shatrugan and uh, did the equation change between them when they married the four brothers so we know about the four brothers the two four ideal brothers so it was not only uh, contrasting the four princesses it was contrasting the four princesses with the four princesses ayodhya versus uh, mithila because janak and dashrath are two the complete opposites so uh, being the protege of janak these girls are janak's girls when they go into ayodhya how do they react and then we going into the family uh, of an it is a uh, when they go into that family it is something very ideal you know when you say that is the <coughs> picture portrayed and then you see uh, the sort of friction between the three queens also when you say that there was some problem with ram and bharat there has to be some sort of a grouse which a kaushalya or a kaike must have had what was that grouse i mean when you see kaushalya as the epitome of motherhood and then you see kaikai as the evil step mother there must have been some point of conjunction some where there the shade meet you know where uh, kaushalya becomes more black and kaikai becomes white i think i was in, uh, interested in that so bringing that out and this whole question i think even when i was a kid i used to wonder what happened to the in the palace once these people went off you know there were just women there so what must have happened so that was another premise for sita sister 
so i think these characters each one has to be made uh, just not brought out from the shadows i think what you have to make is them is uh, make them remarkable make them rational because they have to have a certain consistent consistency in character and you have to make them respectful because in the end you have to respect the character because he has been sidelined for so long whether it's urmila whether it's a mandovi whether it's menka so uh, i think uh, this whole thing of marginalized character the uh, bringing them out i think the charm of it is not uh, you see the not only see the epic in a different light i think you see all the characters in a different light so so what's your take on that samata well i i mean i i I find the epics interesting because um, what interests me more than the epics themselves is our relationship to these epics. Uh, why we empathize with a particular character, how we read ourselves in certain situations, how we interpret it. Is is the Mahabharata about the destruction that can happen from 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 a conflict, or is it about the battle of good and evil? Often, our judgments about these things reflect more about who we are and where we're coming from and where the kind of society we're living in than they do actually on the actual story. So the story itself is evolving in relationship to us. And um, for me, I mean, I've always been interested in the characters in between. um the wives of the rakshasis the ones who are sort of the the, rak- the rakshasi wives you know the ones who are sort of left behind you know who how do you live with defeat uh you you this might be a just war but what happens to these people who i mean is the, is is what's happening to them just either and i think that's that's a very complicated question to ask um and it it strikes it's of interest to me particularly because i come from that kind of in between perspective myself um the reason i was attracted to the mahabharata and the epics in the first place was because i was an indian child growing up in pakistan in karachi my father was an indian foreign service officer serving at the indian consulate in karachi and i you know i was sure on one level very indian on another level i'm my the first time i went to school was in karachi and and i came back at the time i came back to india at the time of babri masjid and so for me it was a and i and when i went to school after that i and i made the mistake of when people asked me where i'd come from and this was 1992 uh where 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 had you come from i said karachi pakistan and with the kind of tensions running at that point everyone thought i was pakistani and i didn't you know i i just didn't understand this concept of nationality enough to clear it up and they started calling me pagal pakistani and no one would sit with me no one would have lunch with me and i felt uh and no one would be my friend and uh all i had were books for friends so i kept on returning the mahabharata and the ramayana and kept on reading them over and over and i think on a certain level read myself into this epic and saw my own story sort of being reflected and i think a lot of us do feel that when we identify with the sita when we identify with the bhim when we identify with urmila on a certain level they speak to the situations or the quandaries or the dilemmas or the choices that we ourselves are in and so for that reason i've always been interested to those in between characters those characters who don't fall on one side or the other much as i don't i i myself at that age at 8 didn't wasn't clearly pakistani no was i clearly indian and i think sometimes those perspectives reveal so much more that you know what really happens in a war even if it's a, a war about good and evil if people are being died what uh, killed what happens to those ones in between what happens to the wives what happens to the orphans um and obviously that appealed to me as an 8 year old it still appeals me to me to today and i think that that's the the gift or or the the one wonder of having some of these lesser known characters um is that if you, if you they they all their situations where it's a ta, tara or a mandodari they always make us reflect on the justice of what's being done on the predominant narrative and to realize that actually there are multiple narratives taking place there might be one big story but there are the the smaller stories the the other perspectives are just as important and as enriching to us so i think in some ways also our mythology is very psychological it's also about ex- exploring things from multiple perspectives i think it's it's not a coincidence that the mahabharat actually started off as an 8000 words poem and then it became 18000 and then finally it's something like 100000 so obviously over successive generations people wove in more and more and obviously they were sort of raising their own questions and bringing in their own perspectives true that true that so do we have time for one last question before we take this to the audience um i think we do um so i would have loved to speak about the feminist aspects of the epics but then we've already had a session on that earlier in the day which some of that was a part of so let's t- talk about another angle here uh the animals in the epics <laughs> <laughs> you know quite ignored they are so um you know w- w- when you when ram was building the bridge uh, to lanka you know the the marine life is what you s- empathize with um in the in your book you know you talk about the marine life getting disturbed because of the the bridges getting constructed the stones getting laid between 
uh, the between the uh, between that part of India and Lanka. And then you talk about uh, you know the brutal killing of the leopard just before uh, Bhim uh, you know meets Hanuman, and the, the way he tears apart his chest and you know pulls its heart out and uh, sort of. So do do uh, animals in general in the epics have a pretty bleak outlook? Oh, I think uh, I, sh I shouldn't be part of this question no, no, at absolutely. all because uh, I think animal definitely. But uh, uh, I have to mention this. I met an uh, extremely interesting person at one of the lit fairs. Uh, he had written a book on the animals of their pigs. Okay. So right from so we only always usually Would you think know of the name of the book. So yes, yeah, Doctor Bha Bharat Bhushan, uh, and he has written. I don't remember the name of the book, but his that book is completely on animals uh, in Ramayana. So the first usually that's what I remember. Uh, talking to him and he said, uh, yeah, the first animal you think of is Jatayu, that's all. And then yeah. we don't even think about the animal life actually, you know, like an uh, identifiable horse. I mean, horse, of course, you have uh, Indra's elephant and you have Indra's, I mean, so these sort of characters, I mean, the whole idea when uh, these are given symbolic uh, names, they become characters themselves. So I think especially Indra, when he, he it was not, uh, when it was the, the the ocean was being churned for the, uh, he saw to it that he got the elephant and the uh, horse the best of the lot so besides nandini i mean when you say nandini she is the eternal cow so it's not about just the tree or uh, uh, the kalpa vriksha i mean animals i think that's the only where i can uh, i think that this is what i have put uh, added in main culture is where the animals were also a personification of human flaws also or human errors and or even human weaknesses they by showing their strength i think they actually show the human's uh, flaws that was so yeah, i have uh, you know one sequence where bhim is battling an asur and just before they start the asur kind of says that uh, you know you aryans you're coming in you're wrecking our forests you're bringing this agricultural way of life and you're wiping out an ecosystem mm -hmm. and then you call us the bad guys mm -hmm. so that was a little you know environmental plea uh, over there and uh, especially that bit when uh, when Arjun is wiping out the entire Kandava forest absolutely. to create in the press. Yeah, and Bhim is sort of shocked at that and says, yeah. "Good God, wasn't that a little extreme?" But uh, you know that is, uh, I think it's uh, something that uh, that sort of echoes till today, where you have uh, big dams being built and lots of people being displaced, and the guys who are building those dams being hailed as heroes of development. So life goes full circle. Um, even when the leopard is killed, in fact, when Hanuman does sort of turn up and after he sort of humbled Bhim a little, he points out that there was really no need for you to kill that leopard, you know, it was a completely brutal thing. And hopefully Bhim takes the message home. So, uh, yeah, hopefully brought in a few environmental points as well. I'd also like to bring up that, you know, now that you brought up the Khandava forest bit, right, the, the, the opening of the, the epic itself is the death of... Um, a big sacrifice of the Nagas. The Nagas, and that doesn't end. Even though the Mahabharata has happened, that karma is following them through. So, uh, and it's still affecting, you know, their descendants generations later. You have you have a, their, their descendant being killed by, by a snake because he disrespects yeah. one. Yeah. So that karma is following through. So I think the, the animals are treated with a certain amount of respect. <laughs> by no, no, they are completely humanized, yeah. I think. So even the animals are humanized. I mean, fate, uh, I think that they, they are victims of fate too. So his destiny and fate is a part of their life also. I mean, when you see, when you see your own pet dog and you see a stray dog, don't you always wonder about that? I mean, I mean, this sort of thing is uh, enlarged in an epic by giving it. Uh, uh, I mean, they have been made grand. I mean, the the entire grandeur of the epic and the narrative is that. But you see that. I mean, animals when you see around it, the whole thing of empathy has to be there. And I think it is told in very subtle ways that the whole concept of parables. I think uh, mythology as a parable is that. I mean, they are showing. Uh, they are you're telling story through animals also. And I, and I was just saying to Kavita, sorry, to last <laughs> night, uh, actually I think, you know, the one of the most interesting characters is Yudhishthira's dog, who turns out to be Dharma, <laughs> you know, and, just, and a god has chosen to incarnate in the form of a dog. So, yeah. wow. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. yeah, I was about so. to mention the dog and also I think there's one little known story about the mongoose who turns up after the great sacrifice, yeah. you know, and he sort of rubs himself and says no. So, you have these little episodes as well, which are quite, uh, quite sweet. And which is that one dog that goes to heaven with Yudhishthir? Yeah, Absolutely, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Who so turns out to be actually Yamraj and Yudhishthir sort of yeah. says, no, I will not enter heaven without this dog that's following right. me. Yeah, which yeah. is a little late for him to develop that sort of... <laughs> but anyway, better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was the session. And uh, so let's get a volley of questions from the audience. 
Um, can we have the, ma the gentleman in the green shirt, please? My question goes to Vikas. And my question is regarding the character of Yuyutsu in the Mahabharat. So what are your thoughts on this character who was part of the Kauravas? From what I understand, he wasn't part of the 100 Kauravas, but he was a half-brother. I don't know whether that's true. Uh, but he decided to change sides on the day of the battle. Uh, he had the potential to be a great warrior, but he chose to instead be an informant. And at the end of the war, he survives, but he's horribly disillusioned with how the battle proceeded. So what can we take home from Yuyutsu's experience? I think it's, uh, you know, the same question that was sort of raised about Vibhishan as well, which is uh, the whole the whole dilemma of right and wrong. And, you know, what exactly is dharma? And sometimes you can, uh, you know, and I think there is this also this whole thing about sticking to the letter of dharma as opposed to the spirit. And I think Yudhishthira is that classic example of a guy who would stick religiously to the letter and in the process perhaps end up with consequences that violated what it was that he uh, sought. Uh, Yuyutsu's character in that sense, I think, is also a very, very telling character, you know, because he, he genuinely believes he's on the side of dharma and unlike, uh, you know, at the point of time when he uh, switches over, there is no guarantee that the Pandavas are going to win because they're heavily outnumbered, in fact. But uh, as the war turns out, and this is a sort of point that Bhim makes as well, you know, the side that is so-called fighting on the side of dharma is actually the side that commits many more transgressions of dharma. Uh, in fact, Bhim kind of says, I guess we're just lucky that we got to win the war and victors get to write history. So perhaps you youths who sort of reflected on that as well. The next question, please. Hello. Hello. Can I be heard? Yeah, yeah, yeah Thank you, you can. Uh, my first question is to the lady on the left. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, I think you pointed out about, uh, you're talking about Yudhishthir's uh, uh, popular image. I think Yudhishthir is today is more seen as uh, the man who gambled his wife. Uh, but I see him as a very complex character. He's also this philosopher king. And, uh, he's also this philosopher king and uh, there are so many aspects to his character. So. Uh, uh, what is the right, uh, how can we really portray Yudhishthir and uh, what are the facets to his character? Because uh, I see the most, uh, the most books these days are on characters like Karn and Draupadi. So I find him very fascinating and very complex as a character, Yudhishthir. And, uh, I think you should write a book. book. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> your that's comments. Why, that's why you have to write a book, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted your comments. And uh, to the gentleman, uh, I would like to uh, say that, uh, well, it's uh, good to see that the books on Bhim and uh, of course, he's a very interesting character. But uh, there are more marginalized voices, uh, which I find very interesting, like, uh, for example, Ashwat Thama. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, I don't know, Dhrishtadyumna. There are many interesting characters. Uh, so what about their yeah, portrayal? Actually, each character can be made into a book. Each sure, one sure, of them. Sure. And a couple of them, not just one. No, no. Yeah. Like as many people take, as there are in this any, audience. You take any character and you sort sure, of flesh sure. it out. They Definitely. are capable. You can re revolve an entire yes, story around. But on there's, the there's actually a book mentioned. on Ashwatthama. I'm sort of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, in fact, one thing that I found very striking about the book was that Ashwatthama sort of feels an enormous sense of guilt that because he asked, you know, because his friends made fun of him when he asked for milk, Drone sort of got angry and then Drone went and so, you know, took up, uh, went to Drupad and then Drupad humiliated him and that set in place a whole chain of events. So Ashwatthama sort of bears that guilt all through the book. It was a, it was a very interesting uh, point of view. I think we are sometimes also, just to respond to the Yudhishthira question, I mean, when I, f when I first encountered the Rama, uh, the Mahabharata uh, when I was young, I mean, you all obviously identify with a character who seems most like you. Though, I mean, on, on just for the sake of gender, I identified with Draupadi. So when I would read Yudhishthira's character, I would always see myself, or, or I would always sort of read him in, in terms of that foil or in terms of that, that antagonism. And, and that's why I found it problematic. Of course, the epic is also, you know, the epics are wonderful because you can keep returning to them at different ages and you will empathize with a different character or you will find yourself be drawn to a different perspective each time. So I would perhaps read it very differently now when I think, you know, constantly in, in life one is forced with choices, uh, with, with trying to make the right choice and often not succeeding. Um, so I think Yudhishthira would speak to me that way now. I think if I can just quickly put in one more point, you know, on Yudhishthira, I think uh, A, he's a fantastic character to psychoanalyze, really, what drove him, what were his motivations. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the whole gambling episode, the myths sort of exist to teach us lessons, not just the right choices that the characters made, but also the wrong choices that they made. You, you sort of draw lessons from them as well. 
and uh, also you know obviously uh, we don't sort of go into one verse today but i think the larger point that the mahabharat makes that when did this whole thing happen it happened shortly after yudhishthir had been crowned samrat you know so you can sort of be riding really high and then you can be sort of going into today's version of exile which is completely being marginalized so you sort of you learn to live with the ups and downs i think that's a the point they make yeah in spite of being told about the story of nal and damanti yeah. so we have the lady in the there is one lesser known character in uh, ramayana shabori uh, i'm interested because my name is ashu shabori <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that what i want to ask you that uh, it has been said that uh, shabadi waited throughout her life just to meet ram rama she did not marry she did not uh, have any other family of uh, like this she was throughout the day she used to collect food uh, some fruits from rama and then uh, throw it up for when she, uh, he did not turn up then once he turned up and he said uh, stayed there for at least uh, only for half an hour or one hour what is what is uh, your version why uh, shabari has to do this she can have her family she can have her own life but why she waited for rama the does this show that uh, to meet your ideal person in your life throughout your life you'll have to wait with this diligence with your this uh, one view that i'm going to meet that person and whatever happens Who's to me who's going to take that kavita mm-hmm. i kavita. think yeah i think shabri is uh, she means patience i mean it's not, not only goodness it's also patience and uh, by telling the story it is also sort of reflecting on ram it was sort of see when ramayan was uh, made valmiki the whole idea what was the praise of ram it was a poem in praise of ram so all these little incidents actually highlight that it's not highlighting shabri it's actually highlighting ram's goodness that he was so good he was a person that people adored he he was not see the uh, earlier the kings especially the suryamashik the dashrath and all they were not part of the public at all so he was one of he was one of the few who actually mixed with the common man i think these are the facets of ram which are being showed through different story whether it's ahilya whether it's shabri so shabri yes i mean it is i think she is the story of uh, lifelong patience uh, and like people of course even wonder whether it's a folk tale or not but whatever i'm not i'm not doubting that what i'm trying to say is that i think it just showed uh, it was a facet of uh, ram's personality also i think that was the we'll take one last question from the gentleman here oh oh we have uh, the mics with the young girl there yeah can we have the question one please the mic held the question not working can you come can you come in the front and probably meanwhile can i have you hello yeah that's better okay okay so okay so my question goes to all of you uh we have sita we have sita's cousin shruta kirti and mandavi uh mandavi what was their take on sita's exile and urmila's 14 years of sleep okay i think <laughs> that was uh, i think the, uh, they are an extension of urmila in fact in my uh, in my book also uh i have shown them uh, there were four of them brought together b- brought up together and uh, sita's exile the exactly i mean what uh, one ram's exile how it affects the entire family is not about uh, uh, a sita or a urmila or a ram or a, i mean as uh, as i said the big characters the small characters how they are affected is that uh, i think mandavi uh, i think since there's nothing about them i think the serial is also on uh, mandavi and Sh- shrutakirti are uh, if you see as them as wives of shatrugan and bharat uh, uh, and then see them as sita's cousins again their role gets a little complicated and uh, in the book i think in mandavi especially i have uh, shown her as a foil to urmila because both of them face the same problem uh, lakshman they ha- both uh, Uh, suffer loneliness and separation in their love and how these two react differently 
uh, that was the uh, difference between uh, mandavi and uh, urmila and i think shrutikriti do being the youngest uh, she is as wise as her husband like shatrugan uh, where shatrugan we uh, he is another completely not all looked at him in completely dismissed where i think it was uh, shatrugan who looked after ayodhya when uh, no one was there i mean bharat was at uh, nandigram so a king who ha- a faceless king who was doing his duties and the wife of such a man and accepting uh, one sister away comp- uh, one sister mourning for a husband and another sister sort of resenting the whole thing so i think uh, this entire uh, relationship between sisters uh was what intrigued me and uh, made me write the book honestly i mean i always wonder because i am a family of we all girls uh, i have lots of nieces i've got two daughters lots of aunts so it was a completely women's family and uh, uh, we are three sisters and i used to always wonder if we three sis- three sisters and married three brothers what would have been it would have been have but anyways so the thing was how and especially when you become a part of a royal intrigue when this whole thing of exile and the throne and uh, power and uh, corruption so i think uh, it it does percolate into the relationship of sisters also so that let's take yeah. that one last question uh, just did you have aside, something to add always, to yeah, uh, sure. no, it's just an aside i've always felt that lakshman's notorious short temper may have had something to do with the fact that his wife was back in the palace well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to add to what you just said about winners writing history mm. I mean I also agree with this that it's not truth which always wins the winner calls himself true when he wins so coming to that regarding the female characters in ramayan for uh, somebody who does intrigue me a lot is shurpanakha now shurpanakha i mean if we take the two instances of what ram uh, relation was with shurpanakha and what uh, ravan's relation is with sita ravan actually took sita but never touched her whereas it is said ram had ka- cut shurpanaka's nose now in hindi it actually says nak kar diya which actually in today's context means that she might have been raped now what is your con- uh, interpretation of that i mean shouldn't we read between the lines a bit more the, because the winner always uh, op- what do i say i mean uh, covers up his own mistakes when he writes history and highlights the loser's mistakes more Mm, in fact you just this, you are discussing my fourth book i am writing about surpanaka so this question yes i mean surpanaka again is the most misunderstood character when you talk about uh, dishonor i mean surpanaka uh, ravan the whole concept of brother sister and the dishonor uh, about uh, the nose being cut now again that's a very controversial topic where uh, they say ram did not do it lakshman did it uh lakshman's logic would be she represented evil a threat to sita that time so there was no question of a gender there she uh, he attacking a woman was she was going to attack sita so he retaliated now that is where uh, i think that that's the logic they used even for tarka when uh, ram and lakshman attack tarka and uh, ram is hesitant about it and that's the time vishwamitra says the same thing evil has no gender evil is evil so i think uh, if you play on that it goes on uh, now if you are going to contrast it with uh, ravan and sita this whole thing i think uh, last time we had this uh, the uh, earlier festival we had the same uh, uh, this uh, this touching uh, i think even in valmiki or any other versions they have never shown Rav- <coughs> ravan touch sita in any way i mean through the characters like surpanaka through mandodari through even uh, trijata i mean it is uh, emphasized or even ramba's curse i mean that curse of ramba uh, ramba's husband uh, they show so there is no question of defilement here it was a message here uh, i think the whole thing was a message to ravan that there is it is sort of a, a signal that there is war is going to happen now the whole thing of dishonoring i mean the whole thing in nak kat gaya as you say i don't know that time in sanskrit if it was that was the whole thing but it was it was it in the end it is kind of because it is in the end she is the sister of the king and again it again uh, brings you back to the question was the the way she approached uh, the two men and how they played uh, played about and they made fun of her i mean the so it is a controversial the whole thing uh, the whole uh, episode has is not 
as easy as it is completely layered so there i think you know, i think if i can just there's there's a certain scholarly yeah please Yeah. No, there is a whole, you know, uh, sort of bent of research that argues that actually this whole thing was a clash of cultures, you know, between the Asuras and the Aryans, if you will, and uh, uh, that the the sort of Asuras were actually a deep, a fairly liberated society, you know, where women could be sort of uh, could take the sexual initiative, and it was no big deal. They could also lead, uh, uh, you know, soldiers into battle, whereas the Aryans. in this telling are a fairly misogynistic bunch and very very offended at the thought of a woman making a sexual advance i i just like to just to give it a different interpretation one of the most interesting uh, i i was reading arsha satar's um, translation of the valmiki ramayana and what i found i mean there's a there's a moment where you know they've gone into exile and they describe the cottage that you know the the the, the place where ram and sita and lakshman are living in and they describe them having placed their gleaming bright weapons on the walls and that these are the things that they have taken with them into exile these weapons even though they have dressed in bark cloth and they are now dressed as ascetics they have taken weapons and ascetics don't use weapons so at that point sita and i because i'm yes. always very interested yeah. in sita's voice raises this question why have we brought weapons into this forest dharma is shukshma dharma is intangible it is subtle by bringing weapons in into a place of peace of, of non violence or, or not that kind of violence you are inviting violence upon you so when surpanaka approaches rather than being ascetics and saying you know look and just go away or whatever they react with violence because they have the means of violence and that is what ed- ultimately leads to war so by carrying in the, in the, it's a very subtle thing but if you carry your weapons with you if you carry your aggression with you you invite aggression upon yourself whether i mean you cannot be judged uh, for the yeah, consequences yeah yeah i think I'll, i'll disagree with you a little is that uh, i think the very fact uh, when they went into exile ram went to fight the demon there he was not going there for peace he was not just supposed to sit and meditate the whole idea the whole thing was that he goes there to fight uh, to flush out the demons out he has not renounced his dharma as a prince no 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 not at all he, he was not supposed to be monastic also he chose to be that or lakshman when he decided to be an ascetic they chose to do that but they were they went as kshatriyas they went as kshatriyas with the weapons that the chariots were full of weapons so then they were i mean that, that there's another question were then they should have gone properly fully as kshatriyas why do they adopt this mix of because being an ascetic because, because that was that was the way uh, kaikai wanted them to shed wear a bark shed off your sense of power and then still fight they didn't tr- they followed the the appearance of it ah, not the spirit of it just i'm just i'm just playing the, the <laughs> this, this 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 um a uh, round of debate will be taken to the author's launch because we have to have to yes. empty the stage we have a lady there waiting for us yes. <laughs> she might shove us off if we don't move in a couple of seconds so thank you all for all the wonderful questions thank you to the panelists vikas kavita and um, samita um hope you enjoy the session and um, we have a couple of other sessions after this break so do stay on thanks <laughs>